So Brian, welcome back. I, we are so excited that you are here today and uh, you were with us just a few weeks ago and it was such an amazing uh, session and, and so much great information that we wanted to have you back. So welcome. Well, thank you so much, Mary and Raj. It's great to be with you. Beska, a real pleasure to have the conversation today. And thanks for the invitation. Thank you so much, Brian. Yes. Thank you. It's last time we covered so many topics and one that really stuck with me was that consistency of character that you um, that you shared with us. And the one thing that I'd love to kind of uh, get us started with is that consistency of character as it leads in every um every part of our life and that ripple effect. And I know you, as, as many of us are also working within the corporate world, that ripple effect it has on so many other areas beyond the borders of the corporate world. I'd love to, to dive into that a little bit and where you see the type of work that you're doing and, and the companies you're working with, what is that ripple effect that you're seeing and, and what's your your uh, take on that and, and how does your work play into that? Sure, I'm happy to. So I love the topic, you know, COC as I call it, you know, consistency of character because that is really at the core of who we are as individuals. You know, no one wants to be in a relationship with someone that on one day they're friendly and then the next day it's a cold shoulder and then the next day, you know, up and down. People want consistency. That's how you build trust. That's how you build engagement. That's how you build a relationship at a deep level. Doesn't mean you're not gonna have an off day or you're gonna have a day that you just, oh, my energy's off. That's life, that's being human. But that consistency is what draws people inward. The number one area that I really focus on so often, especially with my clients who are you know, in the C-suite or leading teams is about their presence. I think people forget how important that is, the presence that you bring to every conversation, how you listen, how you deal with conflict has a massive ripple effect to everyone. And so presence is the starting point for me. And, you know, for myself as an individual, but also in the work that I do to help others remind themselves and to give them tools of how to tap into that presence so they're consistent in their character. So when you say presence, talk to us a little bit about that. What, what would that presence look like? What, as a leader, if I wanted to be more in that presence, because I do want to create that ripple effect, like what would I be looking for? Yeah. So I think the most important thing is, you know, you have to be very, you know, mindful. You hear that term so often, but as a leader, you know, the presence that you give for, let's say, as people return back to work, but I'm just going to use for an example, like uh, an in-person, you know, if you come uh, rushing into a meeting, you know, and you come in and you're, oh, you know, you're not, you're half listening to when someone's saying something. And especially if you're the lead of that meeting, it puts everyone a little nervous, Right. Like it, it puts everyone a little off, like, oh, there's automatically the room starts to fill with an energy of a little bit of attention. And, and how do you engage with that? As a, as a leader, it's very important to realize that before you go in there, take literally, take a moment to just pause and remember why you're going in. That the way you approach that meeting is going to be really important in setting the tone. Sometimes it's okay to say, I just want to say, I'm feeling so rushed. And I just want to have a moment here to, to get, you know, to get grounded. The other aspect is the presence of when there's a conflict. So it was quite interesting. I actually um, got an email yesterday from a client who's in a C-suite and said, Brian, could I connect with you? There's been an issue with one of our board of directors and a staff member in a situation. And, you know, we were on the call and listened and, you know, at the end had clear action and, and what they were going to do. But the CEO said, Brian, your words were in my mind as it was unfolding. My presence in this moment is the most important aspect. Yeah. Because if you become reactive or you become unfocused, you often are not listening to what is spoken without words. 
And that is one of the most important aspects of tapping into that intuitive side of mm. what really is going on here. What really is the issue in your presence of being there and not taking things personally, even if you're feeling triggered is really going to set the path and can change the course of a meeting or a moment that's very tense. One of my uh, executive coaching clients, um, just to il illustrate your point there, Brian, it's, he, he was so fascinating. First of all, when he came to the um, uh, coaching room, you know, it was a year long contract. And uh, first of all, he said, that's guy, I need you to know that I don't believe people can change. I said, oh, OK. <laughs> you know, clearly, his bosses had sent and he was a very senior guy. He was assistant deputy minister in a provincial government. And uh, I said, well, I guess I have my work cut out for me. Well, it took two sessions and he could see that he'd already changed. So, oh, OK, so if I can change, maybe my employees can change. But anyway, the funny part of the story is uh, towards, um, I don't know, halfway through the, the contract or something, he came onto the call and he looked right at me and he said, you know, Betska, today I want to work on, I want to become more charming. Hmm. So, you know, that's about that presence, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, because his bosses would come into the room and they would engage. They'd ask the people about, you know, their camping trips or how was their son's baseball game or anything like that. They were really involved with the people in the room. And uh, my client said, I can't do that. So anyway, mm -hmm. we developed a way that he could establish that kind of presence and that charm using some skills that were um, present in him. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, that's a, another example of, of, um, of presence, you know? Mm -hmm. And I love that. I think that that's a great example, uh, Veska, because what I love about that is sometimes we can, leaders in particular, compare themselves, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, wow, maybe they're more introverted. I just can't walk into a room and be like, hey, how was the weekend and this and that? And remember, some people just don't have that gift and that's fine. Mm -hmm. But developing the ways that are natural, Yes. And, you know, to use a term that everyone uses, but it's, it is the truth of authentic to who you are, mm -hmm. that is going to create a powerful presence because mm -hmm. you're tapping into that truth and it's, it's powerful and mm -hmm. it's effects mm -hmm. on that. Vera, when you're very genuine, I'd like to go back to that COC, consistency of character. Mm -hmm. I've been doing this work for, I hate to tell you, 25 years, I guess. And, um, I love to tell you, and I hate to tell you, I love to tell you. One of the things I've noticed working with leaders, and I've coached leaders in 50 plus countries, that many of them come with multiple personalities. Hmm. Are you familiar with that? Have you worked yeah. with people who have multiple personalities? Because I can tell you, it's very difficult for those people to have consistency of character. Mm -hmm. Because they have these various personalities dragging on them that the negative one will come out in one meeting and then a positive personality will come out in the next meeting. And so, um, you know, I have to work with them to bring their positive personality to the fore and their negative personality to the back of the room. Just wondering if you've had experience with that, because that can affect consistency of character. And I know we're going deep here, but I just thought since I had you here, I'd ask you that question. Yeah, sure. So I think, you know, not just leaders, but I think, you know, all of us, you know, can have a moment that you can have a moment like, wow, did I really just react that way? You know, and, and you walk into their room like, where did that come from? You know, on a deeper level here, you know, there are parts of us that get triggered. You know, there are parts of us that in a particular situation will show themselves and sometimes they're protecting. You know, if they feel threatened at a meeting, they might become all of a sudden just super aggressive. And, you know, that's not just something in that meeting. That's a behavior that probably goes back many, many years, often to when they were a child or in school that hasn't, that needs to be addressed. Refined. So, yeah, exactly. And, and brought out and, and looked mm -hmm. at. So mm -hmm. in those moments, I always tell individuals when they, you know, when I hear that, like, you know, the, I get feedback that in, in meetings, I'm very aggressive, you know, or, or that I'm not clear on things. I'm like, okay, usually when you spend time in that and you show some light, it, there's a reason why they're getting triggered mm -hmm. and they're there. And I often say, this isn't bad. 
This isn't, you know, this isn't something, but there's a way you need to start to look at why. Why is that part coming up? What's triggering it? Mm. So that will help be more consistent, first of all, for themselves. Mm. Because when an individual starts to realize, wow, okay, I'm in this situation, I'm feeling it. Now, what are some of the tools you can do to start to navigate that so you can mm. still have your presence and be there? So it happens. Yeah, absolutely. I always say, don't beat yourself up about it. What is it trying to show you? And how can you take some positive healing steps forward? One of the, uh, when I'm working with uh, spiritual leaders, for example, um, or we, we, we talk about Christ in the temple when the money changers were in the temple and Christ got really angry at them and he kicked them out. You do not do this kind of work inside a spiritual place right in the temple and so i uh we we will have a discussion around well why did christ do that um as an enlightened a, a very pure enlightened soul he really wasn't angry mm-hmm. but he used his anger to make a point mm-hmm. so this is what i i like to um encourage our leaders to do is to get rid of their judgments of people and so we have many tools to help them get rid of that, of those judgments so that they're always in a place of uh, loving kindness and compassion for everyone. And then if they have to use anger, they can use it, but they're not angry inside. They're just using it as a tool to wake someone up. Mm-hmm. So uh, kind of an interesting uh, piece there. Um, I'd like to ask you about <clears throat> universal laws of uh, leadership like the law of service, law of priority, uh, law of karma, and so on. And I'm just, I know you're a man of faith. And so I'm just curious about how you bring in the the law of karma, for example, into your practice with people. Hmm. That's a great question. (laughs) You know, it's as simple as, you know, things that, you know, the way you treat someone else is, is how when you reflect that and you bring that out, we'll come back to you. And and that has to be the way you have to lead. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's it's that simple. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you are, you know, when you lead with generosity, when you lead with a sense of gratitude, when you lead and you believe that and you own that, first of all, you have to own it. You can't teach those things. So these leaders that are saying, oh, I'm authentic and it's approachable, but they're totally different there is because they haven't owned it themselves. Yeah. So you have to first embrace that, but it really will come back. You know, sometimes in my experience, there are leaders that, you know, they may fall short on strategic vision, you know, on something, or they may fall short on financial, you know, being a financial wizard and, and, and something and how to do something but people love them and will say, oh, that's not their strength, but wow. Like they saw a talent in me and brought me forward. You know, they challenged me. Sometimes it's not always, it's sometimes people, you know, there's a challenge that, and they, it helped me grow that no one else ever did. That's powerful. Like Mm -hmm. that's very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. You know, all of the conversation, I I love that conversation. What keeps popping into my head is the fact that nobody is perfect, right? We we Mm. kind of glorify leaders that are on top, they have to have the right answer to everything. And and perhaps it, it this is an opportunity to see that really nobody is perfect. And so thriving for that perfection is probably a losing. Uh, battle. And that's really where the coaching comes in to say, how can we bring in uh, more of what we need to evolve, right, in in your case, or how do we um, equip them with the tools to realize what is holding them back? Because we talk briefly about, you know, the reactionary, the trigger points, and so forth, that a lot of them come from beliefs that are 
built way before somebody ever um, stepped into a leadership role. It could be walled, somebody built up based on experiences that, um, you know, triggered certain things. And I certainly know on a female leadership basis, I've seen lots of female leaders that are keeping their private life somewhat private out of the fear of being judged uh, or said, you know, you, you cannot have this kind of role or you're not able to deliver and so forth. So working with coaches and such as yourself uh, or Betska, uh, that helping them equip them, work through that so they can become a better leader versus mm -hmm. like that perfect person that has to have all the answers needs to be perfect. I don't know. What, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, hands down. So well articulated and presented. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I often will say too that, especially for an, an individual who has aspired for a senior role, and, you know, especially if they're in the C suite and where there's tremendous responsibility, I often say all of their gifts are being used. That's why they got to that role. And, and that's wonderful. And their, and their determination and their openness to be there but also their insecurities are gonna be at a higher level as well. Mm -hmm. and, and that's gonna be something to be able to look at. And I think one of the biggest things is to really help individuals to realize they don't have to own um, all the answers. I mm, think that's yeah. probably the hardest thing yeah. for someone who goes Very into good. that role. They, and I've certainly felt that when I had roles, I had to know everything but you don't. And so you're trying to, they try and compensate. And so to, to own it. And I think it's a, a great leader is someone that can say, I own my strengths. I also am open to learning, but I also want to empower. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. that's where you see a shift. Yeah. And, and that requires a certain level of confidence and acceptance that mm -hmm. nobody expects it to be perfect. It's that growth that matters. It's the, the, the journey of becoming a, a more evolved leader, becoming a better leader that is, um, you know, better tomorrow than we were today. And I think mm -hmm. that brings back that pro progress over perfection. So I, I, I do love that. You know, with the short time we have left, um, I, I'm so curious, Brian, to ask you this question. Clearly, the globe, planet Earth, is in major upheaval right now and has been for many, many years, many decades. It's just that it's exacerbated right now. <clears throat> what advice would you give to global leaders? You know, we've got the UN, <laughs> you know, we've got uh, prime ministers and presidents of countries, different governments, different health organizations. What advice would you give to them to help lift us out of this uh, horrible state that we're in right now? Mm, very simple. That's a brilliant, brilliant insight. It's so simple. It's easier to evolve and change as the world is evolving and changing than to try and stay in the past. And, ah, with, very and with the pandemic that took place, it quieted every single human person on the earth. Mm -hmm. yeah. and when you're quieted, things bubble up. People mm -hmm. start to look inward. Mm -hmm. And so individuals who are returning back to work and are going back to companies are not the same human beings. There is a mm -hmm. deepening. Mm -hmm. And for organizations and companies that believe we can just go right back to resuming life as normal, it is not going to work. Be no. open to what's happening and those are the ones, if you're open to evolving and changing is all that's happening, that is where you're going to have alignment, success, and everything you desire, not yeah. staying in the past. Yeah. Wow. Great Fantastic. advice, eh? Yeah. But maybe how about a couple of characteristics, a couple of um, competencies you would like to see these leaders um, build? What would you mm. like to see them build? Yeah, I think the most important one is, and I think this is so critical, and I think that's going to come up, is about the sense of really embracing the sense of, you know, uh, meditation and mindfulness mm -hmm. and that sense of spirit into mm -hmm. the workplace, yeah. that it has a place yeah. and in a very appropriate way. Mm -hmm. You know, I think one of the things that's really important too, I speak about this is, you know, using your intuition in business. Every single human being has it. Mm -hmm. And I'm all about strategy. I'm all about looking at data points. But sometimes if we're open intuitively, 
if we're open to listening to younger staff members and aspects, that's where the creative ideas will come out of. Yeah. Yeah. And, and really being open to that. I think that's one of the most important things. The more we can train leaders, not train, but open them up to experiences of how that can impact. Whew, I think the, it's, I think the limits will go like beyond we can imagine. Thank you. I totally agree. I would like to see more companies with meditation rooms, more governments with meditation rooms and let their people be quiet for 20 minutes, 30 minutes a day. And they just like Google, I mean, look what happened with companies like that who had meditation and quiet rooms, right? Yeah. Ryan, thank you. It was a real pleasure. Thank you for the conversation today. Thank this is you. great. Thank you so much, Ryan. <laughs> yeah. Can anybody out there hear me?